Well, good morning, everyone. Um, nice to be here. Uh, my name is Franklin Egan. I, I serve as the uh, education director for a um, farmers organization in Pennsylvania called the Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture. Um, just a little bit about our group. Um, we've been around since 1992. We are a uh, a membership organization with about 6,400 members, mostly in Pennsylvania, but we do have a presence in neighboring states, Ohio, Maryland, um, New York, so forth. Um, we are primarily a, a farmers organization. About half of our members are farmers, um, about 13% aspiring farmers, which is really nice to have um, both uh, young people and second career folks interested in our organization and working with us as they try and develop farm aspirations. Um, and then we also have a big uh, kind of membership chunk of uh, entrepreneurs and researchers and agency folks, as well as, you know, families and consumers and, you know, people that like to eat. So we have, um, you know, this great kind of community that, that spans, uh, you know, farm to fork, so to speak. Our uh, main, main mission as an organization is farmer education. Um, we have a, a long history of doing uh, field days, a big annual um, farmer education conference. And um, a few years ago, we um, raised some money through a capital campaign um, to really um, ramp up our, our educational programs. And we, we called that effort the Soil Institute. And one of the big pushes was um, creating a farm-based research program, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about today. Um, so we're not an organic egg organization, although a lot of our farmer members are organic. Um, we are a sustainable agriculture organization, but that leaves a, a big question as to, okay, what is sustainable agriculture and uh, how do we define that? Um, you know, historically, we've always tried to have kind of a big tent perspective on that term. Um, but now moving forward with our research, we really want to put some numbers behind sustainability and have um, evidence and, and benchmarks for um, the work our farmers are doing. So uh, last fall, we organized a, a series of focus groups with farmers across uh, Pennsylvania, across our membership, basically just sitting down and asking them, um, you know, if you wanted to measure the sustainability of your operations, what would you look at? And um, these conversations were really clarifying. We talked with um, a lot of different farmers of different scales, vegetable farmers, livestock farmers, uh, dairy farmers, and they're pretty much all saying the same things, uh, that to them, sustainability was about three points. It was about um, financial viability, it was about soil health, and it was about producing a, a nutrient-dense product, producing um, you know, really high-quality, nutri nutritious food. And so obviously, those are all very deeply interlinked. You, know, you need soil health to produce um, uh, nutritional food, uh, you need a, a good product, uh, particular, particularly for small farmers in the Northeast to stay in business, um, and you need soil health to, to drive all of that. So a lot of really important interconnections here, and we um, decided to jump in with our research program, focusing on that soil health piece as kind of the, um, the foundation of it all. Um, so, so last uh, fall and summer, we began uh, what we've become to call our, our benchmark soil health study, and this was basically a, a simple project designed to understand how our farmers are doing with soil health, and then hopefully start some good conversations about what we could do to to get better. Um, we designed a, a protocol to to do uh, this assessment, working with um, soil scientists at Penn State, uh, Charlie White and, and Christy Borelli. And it's basically two components. Uh, we took field soil samples um, last year from a, a single kind of case study field on each farm. And then we asked the, the farmers to submit a lot of farm records about um, practices that influence soil health. So their tillage and cultivation, planting dates, and uh, for, for cover cropping and so forth, and um, soil amendments. Um, some of these farmers were using a, um, uh, a smartphone app to uh, track all their records and do their farm management, um, an application called Farm Data that uh, one of our uh, members at Dickinson College actually developed. Uh, but a lot of our members were using paper systems or Excel spreadsheets or whatever. We just asked for the records and then make sense of it later. Um, so we um, 
pulled these two pieces together. Um, we we worked with 12 farms last year, focusing on organic vegetable farms. That's kind of the biggest chunk of our membership is um, you know small to mid-sized vegetable operations, typically doing CSAs or farm markets or uh, some wholesale contracts. Got a pretty good sample of uh, soil types and geography across Pennsylvania. Um, you know, we can see it's mostly in the southern half. The northern part of the state is mostly forest, so that's where the, the farms are um, in the southern tier. We um, we sent our soil samples off to Cornell for the the Cornell Comprehensive Assessment of Soil Health. Um, really liked this test for our purposes. Um, you know, both because you get a full suite of biological, physical, and, and chemical indicators. Um, but I find Cornell's approach is really helpful because they will um, they grade your soils on a curve, right? They look at um, a soil sample compared to similarly textured soil samples, and they give you a rating for different indicators on this zero to 100 scale, you know, from really constrained, troubled soils to optimal soils. And then, you know, right there in the middle uh, is a kind of a statistical mean, and they uh, they call that suboptimal. So you know, Cornell being a Ivy League institution, they call average suboptimal. Um, I can make that joke as a Cornell grad with suboptimal grades. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's the soil test part. And then the farm record parts, you know, we looked at all of their uh, planning dates and uh, termination dates across the season and summed up days and living cover. So. For instance, a cover crop planted over the whole field for, you know, the fall months would be 100% cover for that duration. Uh, you, you might have an instance where farmers had um, clover in the pathways and then pulled out the um, the cash crop like tomatoes, and then so for a period of time you might have 50% living cover over the field. Then we looked at all of their tillage and uh, implements, cultivation implements, and we used data from uh, um, the NRCS. Um, I think it's through the Russell model to come up with an index for each implement. So a disc plow would get a score of one, um, and some some lighter disturbance like a tine weeder would be a, a score of 0.5. Um, and so overall, we found that um, this this community of farmers is doing some pretty impressive things for soil health. Um, you know, this is the the means from this you know initial sample size of 12 farms, but um, I think some some pretty promising data here. Um, so we found that uh, the farmers are, are maintaining living cover for 225 days of the year. And to put that in perspective, a, um, a, a corn soybean rotation in Pennsylvania without cover crops, which is still most of our row crop acreage, would be about 156 days. Uh, we found average soil organic matter of 3.3%, and we compared that to uh, the NRCS benchmark for, for that soil type, um, and that was on average about 2.7 percent. So, you know, some improvement over the baseline expectation for the soil. And then, on average, uh, the farms had a, a soil health score of 71, with again 50 being the um, the the mean. So, so pretty great results. Um, we're starting to experiment with graphics like these to try and um, try and help our farmers uh, tell their customers about what they're doing for soil health. So. Um, get kind of the word out to their CSA customers or their their wholesale contacts um, about what they are actually doing and achieving for sustainability on the ground. So those are the means, um, but of course it's it's a distribution. So we look at the overall Cornell soil health scores on on these 12 farms, and you you see a range, um, and we see this cluster of you know really pretty amazing farms uh, up in the optimal category. And so one of, the, one of the real points of this project is that we could return this data to the individual farmers to help them see where they are relative to their peers. Um, but then also we can do field days on these excellent farms and we can um, really use the soil health test data and the uh, indicator data to get kind of under the hood of those operations and start talking about their soil health operations um, in a more data-driven way. Um, so we had a, an example of this just last month. Uh, had a really big, uh, successful full-day field day at Spiral Path Farm, uh, which is one of our 
kind of largest and most successful organic veg growers um, in, uh, in central Pennsylvania. And really spent the day um, using soil test data to go from start to finish to understand what they're doing to build soil health. Um, you know, we looked at their organic matter ratings. Um, their fields are rated for about 2%. They're now up to um, over 5% organic matter on their farms. And that's been a, a slow, steady build from when they started in the 80s um, all the way up to now where they're averaging 5.6% um, organic matter. We looked at the different indicators um, from the uh, Cornell soil health test, both um, you know the good stuff and the um, you know more challenged stuff. Um, this farm had uh, issues with aggregate stability, which you would expect from you know tillage on organic farms. Um, really, uh, really thriving scores for um, soil respiration, for minor minor elements, and for their overall soil health score. Um, an issue with phosphorus, really very high phosphorus levels on the soils um, from a legacy of uh, hog farming on this farm back in the 80s. So that kind of indicates how long it takes to, to deal with phosphorus saturation. And then we talked about you know, our, our indicators from the, um, from the management. So we found that this farm was really our leader in, in days and living cover, um, maintaining cover for 320 days of the year. They were also our, our, our leader in terms of tillage, um, you know, a tillage score of, of nine for the season with multiple passes of a disc plow and um, you know, some pretty intense soil disturbance. So looking through the data and, and talking at length with the, uh, the farmers, Will and Mike Brownbeck, um, we kind of distilled for this field day um, really three principles that they apply very consistently on their farm. Um, the first is healthy crops grow healthy soil. And um, I think maybe that sounds like a really obvious statement, um, but it's also kind of a, a subtle inversion the way they apply it on their farm. You know, we typically talk about, uh, I, find that, I find research and extension typically talks about soil health as you want soil health, you can get a healthy crop or a, a high yield. Um, but it also works the opposite way, right? If you are uh, continually maintaining very healthy crops. Those crops are building soil as they grow and produce yield. So that's something they really focus on is, is using their vegetable crops as a tool for building soil health. Um, uh, they're very intensive both in their um, uh, cash cropping, you know, very um, often double cropping vegetables, but also very, very diligent about cover cropping, um, fitting cover crops into every possible window both in space and time of the farm. And then you know, the last thing they really push on their farm is, is uh, they do have to till as an organic farm, but they are very thoughtful about making sure soil conditions are appropriate, um, really trying to avoid um, uh, you know, soils that are too wet for, for, for tillage or other um, machinery applications. Um, this past spring, we had a lot of rain in Pennsylvania in, in May and June. Um, they actually uh, decided to go out and hand transplant with their field crew 20,000 tomato transplants uh, because they didn't want to get a water wheel transplanter on the field and, and risk compaction. So um, really kind of a, a, an ethic there. We, we focused throughout the field day on these different, comp these different systems and kind of talked about how they build that um, top to bottom starting with a, uh, a very kind of well-engineered compost system that is um, you know, not designed to um, be a source of macronutrients, but really a source of, of soil biology. Um, and they use that to actually apply to their cover crops in the spring and prime the cover crops for um, soil building. Um, they have really well dialed in greenhouse uh, cultural practices um, and a, um, a well-engineered potting mix from vermin compost that they have developed that um, sets the crops up with optimal transplant health, really about that, you know, healthy crops build healthy soil mentality. Um, I mentioned their crop rotations, and then um, they're very diligent throughout the year in keeping the crops at, at optimal health for, for again, for soil building. Um, pretty intensive on the organic scale in terms of inputs um, using, you know, OMRI approved fertilizers as well as pest control products. Um, 
Uh, this was one of the more interesting field days that I've been a part of at PASA. It was really refreshing to be able to do something like this um, and talk about it, um, not just at the level of kind of anecdote and this is what we're doing, but to have uh, numbers and, and soil test data behind uh, everything that the brownbacks were, were featuring and explaining on their farm. We hope to do a lot more of this kind of education as we, we move forward with our research program. So um, I just want to close with some some interesting data, and I realize um, I have you know 12 data points at this farm uh, at this point, and we're really looking to grow grow this project. But um, I think there's some interesting things here um, with regard to the question of you know balancing tillage and soil health. Um, you know we all know that organic farmers use tillage for weed control, and it's a real um, challenge in organic farming. Um, but at least among this community of farmers, we, we definitely saw examples where uh, pretty intensive soil health or pretty intensive tillage is being very well balanced um, with soil health. And you, know, you can see there's really no correlation to speak of there in the tillage index and the soil health scores. Um, usually when I, when I show this data, people say, well, well yeah, that's because they're you know, just really loading the soil up with manure or compost or some other organic matter subsidy. Um, but we haven't really seen that either at this point. Um, we looking at you know total um, what I would call organic matter subsidies on these different farms. Again, not really a pattern of of that driving soil health. There's a lot of different things going on. And looking at these farms, I think we see kind of two main case studies, two broad strategies for for soil health. Um, one I would call the the healthy crops, healthy soils approach, which which the spiral path farmers use. Um, and then the other kind of broad broad one that really seems to get soil health scores up, up into the 80s um, would be a kind of a rest and recover approach where uh, farmers have a, a two to four year schedule of intensive vegetable production and then um, a full one to two year, two year rest of hay production or maybe just to cover crop fallow. So, um, yeah, we're really looking forward to moving this project forward. Um, we had 12 farms last year. We've we've grown that to 27 farms this year, and um, just this past month wrapped up the soil sampling. Um, you know, doing sampling and getting records now from from three fields per farm, so we get a more kind of comprehensive look at the, at the system. And um, at our conference, at our field days throughout the year, are looking forward to having soil test data and, and on farm data drive what we're talking about and how we do our our farmer to farmer education. So uh, thanks for your time. Um, I have uh, with me some uh, reports, annual reports about PASA's work, uh, if anybody wants to learn more about our organization and, and what we're doing. So thank you.